We're delighted to welcome you to the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Dettol. It's a pleasure to present today Maximum Schemes, Minimum Welfare. Yamini Ayer, Rohit Kumar Singh, Hindol Sen Gupta and Suchita Dalal in conversation with Mohit Satyanan. At a time when optics is all, the proliferation of high-sounding and well-meaning schemes has little correlation with the actual impact on ground. Maximum governance, minimum government seems to have been turned on its head both in the NDA and in the subsequent Modi governments. A session that examines the welfare architecture in terms of state capacity and abilities within the larger narrative of empowerment. Jamini Ayer is the President and Chief Executive of, for, of the Centre for Policy Research. Historian and author Hindol Sen Gupta's books include The Man Who Saved India, The Modern Monk and Being Hindu, Understanding a Peaceful Path in a Violent World. Journalist Suchita Dalal is the managing editor of Money Life. Rohit Kumar Singh is the additional chief secretary at the Medical and Health Family Welfare Department, Jaipur, Rajasthan. They speak to entrepreneur and investor Mohit Satyanand on how to envision and implement reforms that improve efficiency and delivery in the social sector. Jamini Ayer. Jamini is the president and chief executive of the Center for Policy Research, one of India's leading think tanks. Jamini's work sits at the intersections of research and policy practice. In 2008, Jamini found the Accountability Initiative at the Center for Policy Research. The initiative is credited with pioneering one of India's largest expenditure tracking surveys for elementary education. Jamini has published widely in academic journals and the popular press. Our next speaker, Rohit Kumar Singh. Rohit is an officer of the Indian Administrative Service. He worked extensively at provided leadership in the areas of public health, finance, infrastructure, public-private partnerships, information and communication, technology and external aid, portfolio management. Currently, Mr. Singh was in the forefront to successfully lead the fight against COVID-19 pandemic as ACS, Medical and Health Rajasthan, during Jan to June 2020, where Rajasthan was the front-runner on most of the parameters. Our next speaker, Hindol Singh Gupta. Hindol is a multiple award-winning historian and author of nine books. He has been a evening scholar at Worcester College at Oxford and a Knight Baghdad Fellow at Columbia University. He is a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. He is Vice President and Head of Research at Invest India, the National Investment Promotion Agency of the Government of India. Our next speaker, Suchita Dalal. Suchita is among the best-known financial journalists in India. In 2006, Ms. Dalal was awarded the Padma Shri based on her outstanding invest investigative journalism since the early 1990s. Her 35 years of investigative reporting spans the Harshad Mehta scam, CR Bhansali scam and expose of Enron among others. She served as a member of SEBI's primary market, Narayan Murthy Corporate Governance Committee and as a member of Investor Education at the Protection Fund of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. She has co-authored the best-selling book, The Scam from Harshad Mehta to Ketan Parekh and a biography of A.D. Shroff, A Titan of Finance. In conversation with Mohit Satyanand. Mohit is an entrepreneur and investor and has been instrumental in establishing businesses that produces packaged foods, promote the arts and tech languages. He is currently the chairperson of Team Arts and also serves on the boards of several other companies, both public and private. He is an active angel investor and mentors a wide range of startups. Please do remember to comment by typing it in, into this comment section on your screens. Ladies and gentlemen, now presenting Maximum Schemes, Minimum Welfare. Jamini Ayer, Rohit Kumar Singh, Hindol Sen Gupta and Suchita Dalal in conversation with Mohit Satyanan. Enjoy the session. Thanks so much all of you for coming on to this uh, virtual JLF, which has been quite vibrant, quite exciting. And I'm going to start by thanking the entire team at Teamwork for bringing some of the spirit of Jaipur onto the screen. It's been quite, quite admirable. We have a very short time. So I'm uh, not going to dwell on, um, on politeness and just jump straight into it. Yamini, I've been very fascinated by the arc of uh, the political economy of welfare. And I'm going to go back to, I think it was May 2019, when at the annual Four Think Tank review of the um, budget, you said that uh, India has taken a decisive step towards welfareism in the last few years of um, the Modi government. Uh, this was quite a radical change for those who expected um, the Modi government to shift away from the UPA um, Jola bag kind of stance. And now with this budget, we've seen another move in the other direction. So it's been quite a quite an arc or several arcs. Can you 
give us a three minute sort of uh, perspective on these shifts in the political economy of India. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Mohit. And uh, thanks to Teamwork and the Jaipur Literary Festival for such a wonderful and vibrant online uh, version of the festival and also for inviting all of us to have this discussion. I think let me premise by saying that I firmly believe that uh, in a country like India where uh, income inequality is as vast as it is, uh, welfareism is an essential component of what the state should do. And I also believe that welfareism or, whether, or, or rather investment in human capital is constitutive of growth, not a sideshow that can come after growth. The argument I was presenting at the uh, discussion that you referred to, Mohit, was that one of the most important challenges that any government at the center uh, uh, faces is how do you design a pathway of growth that is actually enabling of all Indians to be active participants in growth. And one of the big challenges of the welfareism that we have, we were seeing over the first uh, three, the last three years of the first term of the Modi government was a welfareism that was essentially about providing private uh, goods through the public system. So housing, toilets, uh, you know, uh, cash transfers was very much part of that debate. So cash in your individual bank account, less a framing of core investments in public goods, health and education being important ones. And in a, in a you know, we can quibble over whether those are genuine public goods or not, but for the moment, I'm going to stay with that. Um, that could allow for enabling conditions for all Indians to be active participants in the economic, uh, in the everyday economics of the country. When Modi came into power, there had been an exhaustion with what many felt was uh, an overly jolawala, as you describe, uh, framing of welfareism of the UPA. The, the narrative of inclusive growth became very much about schemes and programs. I think that they, I have a slightly different take on that, but we'll come to it later. His whole framing, maximum government, governance, minimum government, red carpet, not red tape. Uh, the expectation was that there would be this big, big bang push to deep factor market reforms. That was the next uh, step from the 1991 moment. In that first term, we didn't see that. Instead, we saw a very a uh, quick shift from 2015 onwards mapped closely to the Bihar elections and the suit boot Sarkar challenge that I think stayed with uh, in the political framework uh, with an excessive focus on welfareism. Many felt frustrated that this was not a government that was going to do the deep reforms. Uh, and I think what's been really intriguing to me is that in the midst of the pandemic, when in fact, all of Bombay is saying income support is necessary. Forget about fiscal deficits. It's usually always been a challenge between the fiscal hawks versus where and how the state should spend. The government has been extremely conservative about where it is putting its money and is looking much more at a, can I make the crisis an opportunity to institutionalize a set of changes, I'm saying changes and not reforms, uh, into how markets operate uh, for in deep factor markets like, like like agriculture, like labor, and potentially perhaps also like land. So there is a transition we are seeing away from public, private provision of public goods towards public provision of private goods. Public provision. Yes, public provisioning of private goods towards uh, uh, towards focusing more on changing the dynamics of markets. Perhaps in the hope that those dynamics of shifts in the in market dynamics will create the enabling conditions uh, for. I'm going to stop you there and go over to Hindol. And Hindol, before we get into what's happened in the last uh, few months, particularly uh, through the pandemic and uh, this last budget, uh, you have commented on the nature of uh, welfareism during the uh, first term of the um, uh, NDA government. Would you care to react to what Yamni said about um, the welfareism being very scheme driven and not tackling the broader true public goods such as health and education? I think there's an understanding within the government that uh, uh, while India is going through great transformation, not just, of course, um, you know, at, at a policy level, but also with issues like deep digitization. And this transition is going to be in many ways difficult. Now, the question for any government at the moment is what, does, what can one do 
to push forth such changes and yet make them as far as possible painless. Now, there are two or three ways you can do that. One, of course, is to consistently chip away. In our country, it's difficult to do very big ticket reform on, all in one go. Governments need to stabilize, get a, you know, you know, plant their feet firmly on the ground and then push through some different things. I think what this government tried to do, and I take the point about Sood Boot Kisarkar, but I think what the government really tried to do is first get its feet on the ground. And now you're seeing, you know, a, a, a far more dramatic and a far more dynamic efforts towards change. Yeah, let's stay with, let me interrupt you, Hindol, and talk about the first. Yes, please go on. Okay, I'm going to just make my complete my point because I think uh, maybe Mohit Satyanand's uh, network is a little uh, patchy. The point I was trying to come to is that we are at the moment going through a very deep, uh, you know, transition of the Indian economy at many levels, not least because of COVID. And what the government has tried to do is use a phase-wise approach by inserting change in policy interventions at various levels, whether it's to chip away uh, at, you know, archaic laws, whether it's to ensure that transfer of money happens using a digital process into the sections of the population that needed the most. Mm -hmm. And of course, more big ticket reforms as pro promised in this government, including in divesting certain public sector companies. But uh, the question always is what comes first? And I think this government has tried to take a phase-wise approach. And I think now in the next few years, we will probably see many more uh, big ticket reforms to being uh, pushed through. And there will always be challenges to those, as of course we're seeing with the farm laws and, and the problems that are occurring there. But I don't think that uh, those challenges necessarily will stop all reform because um, there, is a, there is a deep structural need for reform in the country. And I do think the government understands that it's a now or never moment. Uh, Mohit, you're, uh, you're on mute, please. Uh, Annette, um, I want to go back to the comment that, um, uh, that Yamni began with. And in a sense, this is something that you've also talked about, which is the, the one of the definitions of uh, welfare state is something that uh, uh, provides public goods of the best available standard to all its citizens. And uh, without going into too much of a debate of what constitutes public goods, let's take health and education. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, of these in terms of uh, creating capacity on the ground, also coupled with the fact that we know that employability is a big issue in this country. What have we seen, and I'm going to throw this open to both Yamni and Rohit, perhaps to Yamni first and then to Rohit, what have we seen as the ability of the Indian nation, uh, I know that the achievements are different from state to state, in terms of providing education? Yamni, I don't hear you. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, at an aggregate level, here's the challenge, right? 50% uh, of uh, uh, Indians, the students who are going to school complete five years of schooling, but can barely read a class to textbook, us our data, widely recognized. The interesting challenge with education for India is we've actually made great progress uh, in terms of our ability to. Yamini, I think I'm the second unit running somewhere. Somebody is either Nihindol or Mohit, so we're getting an echo. Do you have two programs running at the same time, Mohit? Uh, Yamini? Yamini? Yamini, Yamini, speak. Go ahead. No. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Go Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Okay. Sorry, I, w I was saying the the interesting the, the interesting uh, uh, issue with education is that in fact india has actually made great progress especially since the two, late 1990s 2000s in achieving the goal of universalization of education that was it that's in fact been the global goal in a sense which is ensure that schools and students have access to each other uh, and we have uh, consistently if you look at our data in particular which i i refer to because it's one of the largest and and on on 
repeat since 2005. We've been at near 98% of enrollment rates across the country. There still remains a last mile challenge that is still to be fulfilled, but we've achieved a lot. Schools have been built, teachers have been hired, students have been enrolled. But the classic state capacity challenge of India is we the, the entire bureaucracy, the Indian state is well aligned to provide inputs. It's when the state has to transition from the provision of inputs to outcomes, when the challenge starts becoming much, much more acute. So you've got the children into school, but you haven't yet been able to make the system accountable for what students learn. And that challenge is one that remains extremely acute. In 2010, we introduced the right to education. In my opinion, the framing of that law was designed to solve a problem that had already almost been solved, which was a problem of universalization of education. What we needed to think about was how do you build the architecture of the state in a way that it can be genuinely responsive and accountable to the challenge it confronted of once you've got the school building in place and the teacher more or less around, although occasionally often they don't show up, but they're still there, and the students in, how do you ensure that everyone learns to a degree of standard? We are still dealing with that challenge. Rohit, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, I think uh, for any sector like health or education, there are essentially three verticals. One is infrastructure, one is human resources, uh, and the third is quality of services. Now, as I would agree with Yamini to that extent that we have done reasonably well in providing infrastructure. We have created infrastructure for schools. HR is a bit tricky. We have uh, recruited so many teachers, but with, when it comes to going, uh, reaching far away places, especially in terms of Rajasthan's challenges on geography and distances, we, I will call it a mild success. But the third and the most important is the quality of services, whether it's health or education. You know, how, uh, first of all, are we measuring it enough? Or are we doing enough to ensure? So I think the challenge is in the third vertical, which uh, I think cannot be achieved without engaging uh, very proactively with the private sector. The state has its limitations and uh, I'm a big PPP fan and unless we do good, uh, positive, synergetic uh, partnerships with the private sector, we will not be really be able to achieve the third part, which is the quality of service. Uh, Yamini talked about input versus outcome. There is another third thing between called output. So we measure our successes in inputs and outputs, but outcomes, yes, there is much left to be desired. Hindol is somebody who's looked at policy issues from, uh, from the top down, as it were. Um, PPP as a general concept uh, seems to have failed in infrastructure by and large, with some, some exceptions. I would argue that the RTE was actually a step backwards in terms of uh, making it more difficult for, uh, for private schools, especially budget private schools, to function. How would you look at this as a policy analyst? How does one take this forward? I think we should take a step back on education and ask some fundamental questions. Let's take the point of digitization. I go to many places where people talk about digitization as a solution, right? Well, there are all these teachers, as Yamini was saying, well, there are all these teachers, there are all these students, but do they get what they really come for? And what do they do after they go out of school, right? And we don't have clear answers on those. Some people say, well, you know, to really penetrate these things, you need deeper digitization. I am of the opinion that digitization will only take you so far. Digitization can do certain things, but there are certain things that need human intervention at a capacity building level on the ground, which only digitization, and I think we romanticize digitization a little bit. This is not to say digitization cannot achieve many, many. I'm, I'm with you completely, um, but take it forward. You know. So the problem there is unless you make intervention, when I hear, I want to make the point about decentralization. The problem, you will never get the outcomes that you really want unless you can really decentralize it to a much further degree. At the moment, according to me, it's still far more centralized than I would like it. And, you know, uh, Rohit made the point of getting in the private sector. Well, there are two solutions. One is decentralized. The other is getting in, getting in more private sector interventions at the local level. So it has to become less top down. It has to get more decentralized and you need to get the private sector in. But going the whole hog only to say that private sector alone is the solution, that also is obviously the solution. One is, no one is suggesting that it's either or. Uh, 
And all I was making the limited point, and Yamni, I'd like you to come in on this if you would like to, that the RTE made it more difficult and more demanding for the private sector entrepreneur in, in education. Would you agree with that? So I think what the, R, the RTE actually, I, I agree, uh, but what it's done is actually highlight a far deeper challenge with the PPP story, and I would, uh, which I want, which is my submission here, which is that we always, as we have a long assumed that the private sector can come in where there is government failure and uh, you know uh, now increasingly for the provision of public goods too what we haven't been able to think through is what is the appropriate regulatory architecture even for that right so what what's the what of regulation in education and then there is a question of how of regulation in education what the rte did is that it said i'm going to regulate the what but I'm going to regulate the what on the basis of a whole set of inputs, which most parents have said are irrelevant to me. I really care about the outcome and what, what is going to happen in terms of the quality of learning my children may or may not receive. Uh, and even if you say that the focus has to therefore be on the outcome, what is the regulatory architecture of an input-based accountable bureaucracy to design a system that can actually hold you accountable for the outcome? We are struggling that with that even within the public system. So if you can solve it, for the public system, we may not need that private as well. The second point I wanted to make uh, and to provoke Rohit, uh, which is that when we talk about PPP in the provision of core public goods, I often wonder, as a citizenry, we are very disenchanted with the state in terms of the state's ability to deliver core services. I live in New Delhi and in my home is a, pri is a private guard. Uh, we have our own private water tube wells. We go to private schools. We go to private hospitals. I've encountered the state most when it decided to lock me down and told me how many people I can have in my car as I wanted to leave the house. But we've exited and uh, we don't demand this of our state. State because we have exited our politics conundrum. Why is it that education and health doesn't come up? I also feel that the state and particularly our bureaucracy, recognizing the complex challenge that it confronts, also is somewhat disenchanted with the state's ability to deliver. And I actually sometimes feel I am more committed to the idea that the state can give me good health and education than the state is. Uh, and I'm saying this largely to provoke a response from Rohit because I think it's a very important conversation that we should have. What does the state believe it can do? So Mohit, we had agreed that Yamini will not provoke me, but now she's... <laughs> <laughs> I was not party to that agreement. Uh, so I, but I, would, I would like to give the example of health sector. You see how the public primary health is taken care of by the government infrastructure and people in HR, while by interviewing it uh, smartly with Ayushman Bharat, how the poor are being given quality tertiary care in private hospitals. So I think that, that is one model which can be replicated in different sectors. I mean, there's a huge risk issue when you do public-private partnership and uh, how do you mitigate the risk of the private sector, especially when there are no assured revenue streams. So you have to very smartly structure the model, which is very important. And uh, I want to give an example quickly of the highway sector. When the normal PPP, BOT talk was not working, uh, I was in the ministry then, and we developed a new model called the hybrid annuity model, where we de-risk the private sector, but we put their skin in the game till the maintenance of 15-year period. So what the point I'm trying to make uh, in response to Yamini is that uh, there is not a single model of PPP for every sector to have. I think that's I think that's fine. She was just trying to provoke you, um, Rohit. I want to get into health. I want to get into health. You talked about tertiary. Yes, we recognize that you know Ayushman Bhai tackles uh, uh, tertiary health, but what about primary health? And I want to jump into the experiences that we have had with the COVID uh, pandemic. Luckily, it seems as though we were not as badly hit as the rest of the world. Uh, as a citizen and uh, watched from very close up as to what was happening in Bombay in the government hospitals. So Cheta, can you talk about the quality of, this is not tertiary, but primary and secondary care during a crisis and how well or badly government hospitals were equipped to deal with the problems of COVID? So, you know, I want to make a larger point 
that the previous speakers also made, which is that we've had a game changing last year. Okay, all bets were off, and uh, life as we knew it was very different. And I think everything needs to be re-examined from how we dealt with uh, the COVID pandemic, whether it's education, where you know what I agree with a lot of what Yamini says, but I'm sure there's absolutely new research required about how many people have been left behind. Again, Hindol said correctly that, you know, depending on digitization is a problem and that you have seen in education because the poorest have been left far behind in this one year, right? So it's exactly the same with health. Uh, we saw that very closely because what the pandemic did is it put public, private and everybody on the same footing, right? So you had the pandemic, there was panic, and everybody was unprepared. Believe it or not, the private sector was more unprepared than government. The government has been focused on, as again, Yamini said, uh, privatizing some of the public benefits. So the entire focus has been that we want to even sell off primary healthcare centers. We're not going to focus on them. Let's privatize everything, and they will run themselves. So the COVID exposed how uh, short-sighted that is because you can't give people an insurance policy, which seems to be the, uh, you know, had been the thinking in government pre-COVID, and hopefully there's going to be a big change after that, which is that as long as we give insurance, private people will take over all our primary healthcare centers, make, in, make them very modern, and we will give people insurance policies and they'll buy all the healthcare that they need because they'll have an insurance. I don't think it's working like that because our experience in COVID, and we worked very closely as Money Life Foundation with 12 or 15 hospitals. And I must say that Bombay and Maharashtra has done a pretty good job because Bombay especially was expected to explode. And I think, you know, the first three months were bad, but we handled it well. The entire focus, the brunt of it was borne by the municipal corporation and the public health organizations, the large KEMs and others who were as full as they could possibly get. They had patients on the floor and that's been the state of affairs for a long time. So two big things happened. One is that the government had to open its purse strings and push money into government hospitals. And so for instance, you know, you have four big hospitals or four or five big government hospitals in Bombay. They're huge, they're Nair, KEM, Sion Hospital, JJ, which, you know, take on the heat, take on the pressure. So the government discovered hospitals like Kasturba, which became the COVID center, or there was a TB hospital at Baikala, which, you know, we didn't even know it exists. Beautiful, leafy sort of enclave. There's no more TB the way it was before. They just pushed in a lot of infrastructure very, very fast and created facilities. The municipal corporation then created these public jumbo centers and only that, including bringing digitization into it, you know, getting helplines working, all that was done by the government. So I, you know, my point is that I don't think things can be privatized. Privatization is not the answer. Privatization, and you know, I talk as a business journalist who writes on markets. Okay, and I'm saying that without adequate regulation, regulatory accountability. So one is it's not enough having a regulatory framework for everything, it's completely meaningless because the first independent regulator we have seen is SEBI. You've looked at the kind of destruction that's happened in the banking sector in the last year. And, you know, the RBI is a regulator. All of these people have zero accountability. So unless there is regulation with accountability, it's not going to work because then privatization is going to be disastrous. All the big fancy hospitals in Bombay for the first few months were literally locked down. They didn't know where their own employees are. They didn't know how to bring them. So having the best equipment, having the government step in and say that we are going to decide what you're going to charge so you don't exploit people. Even all of that was no use if you could not bring their people and make them work. The only I'm going, ask, I'm going to ask Rohit to step in over here, somebody who's on the ground. Rohit, what are the issues with accountability for somebody who works so closely with primary sectors, whether in health or in education? Oh, we, we face the same problem here. We are not Bombay, uh, but even our private sector failed initially when it came to COVID. And uh, our public sector hospital did rise to the occasion. And I think most of the uh, parameters where we uh, were ahead in the country were purely because of the public sector hospitals. Uh, so uh, to Suchetha's point, I'm not saying you privatize everything. As I said earlier, you have to smartly 
structure as to what is the core competence of the government which they can handle and which the other non core activities that should be prioritized look at the e seva of passport issue you know the issuance of passport this is not government i mean this job can be done by tcs or something else but you know uh, certifying their credentials and checking their security issues yes that should be done by the government so in any sector we have to see what is the core activity that the government has to do and what is a non non core activity the peripheral activity that could be outsourced uh, in health of course it's purely uh, primary versus uh, part secondary and tertiary secondary and tertiary is best left to the private sector that is what probably they are trying to achieve through ayushman bharat and primary in far flung areas in rural areas and even in urban centers has to be handled by the government yamani and uh, hindor what are you seeing in terms of uh, budgets and provisioning for primary health in this country is is there signals of a commitment to uh, improving primary health in our nation yamani first well i mean to the to the extent that budgets are an indicator of prioritization primary or tertiary uh, for ever since i uh, stopped being a student and entered the world of the of developmental practice and policy research the argument has been steady uh, india needs to spend at least double or triple percentage of gdp than it currently spends on health there have been endless number of committees that have made this point and we still even after a pandemic uh, at least the government of india hasn't yet been able to allocate uh, very much to health uh, i think that one of the interesting uh, if you look at the patterns of expenditure from 2005 onwards when the national health mission was launched which was really one of the, the starting of a, a sort of post liberalization big push towards public health uh, investments the emphasis was uh, largely in primary but also specifically on maternal and child health uh, reproductive and maternal and child health and that's really where a lot of innovation has happened uh, you know we've also uh, you know this is a story of doom and gloom they have been very very important uh, improvements in our core health indicators that uh, have traversed this period as well um i think that in uh, the since about 2016 or 17 with the launch of the ayushman bharat there was a clear we had already begun to experiment with moving in the direction of uh, more investments in tertiary and some expenditure switching was inevitable as a consequence perhaps uh, that's where the focus rested in the current budget uh perhaps because of budget constraints um uh and uh, you know we can argue about whether that's right or wrong i i believe we should have invested a lot more uh not much has changed in terms of the overall budget of the government of india but let us not forget the crucial issue and rohit is here to testify to that health is a state subject and it actually the bulk of the financial burden of covid response has rested with state government of india did not open its purses it should have it did not uh and uh, the future of health the health systems because there are many different health systems will rest in how states respond kerala is one example rajasthan has a different set of needs bihar has a different set of needs disease trajectories are also different so the answer is going to lie in how states choose to invest uh, and how states are going to view the futures of their health systems against the backdrop of what they have experienced i think one just last quick point what rohit was alluding to even in ppp what the Uh, hindol was alluding to on the decentralization issue what sucheta was talking about about regulation at the heart of all these the issues we've discussed is the challenge of the capacity of the indian state it has an inordinate ability historically to show up in places in large numbers where it perhaps should not airports until recently was a good example of that public sector enterprises in many uh, sectors is another example but it is completely absent where it needs to be it is remarkably thin what uh, rohit and uh, the ias biradri and actually and i bureaucracy has done over covid with, with absolutely minimal resources is quite phenomenal because they just aren't even simple things we don't have enough people on the ground we also haven't fully decided what level of government should be performing what level of function So historically- before before Rohit comes in, Yamni, we are sort of now we're starting to get questions. Before uh, Rohit's response to what you said, I did ask Hindol whether he would comment on this. So Hindol, quick comment. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, so I mean, I agree with Yamini that essentially a lot would depend at the decentralized level. I mean, what do states do? What do do? What do districts do? And 
so on and so forth, right? And you would have to measure it at that level. Also, this point about how the state should have spent more, the central government should have spent more. You know, there are countries in the world which spend much more than India did. And today, many of them are now re-questioning how much they spend, how much they could really afford. And I'm of the opinion that India staggered levels of spending and intervention. And I can already see how many disagrees, which is perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the most fiscally sensible way for us to have behaved. We can only afford so much, mm. and we can read. I, you know, this is this is a subject about is a sub it's very dear to my heart, yes. Rohit and to Yamini's. But let's not get too much into economics, Rohit. Something about the states and their ability to spend on uh, uh, primary health. I think uh, you know. I would probably surprise many of you that there is no dearth of resources. The problem is with our stuck-up procurement processes. I mean, if you check with any state, they hardly spend 70% of the National Health Mission Fund. I mean, I've seen the statistics when I was the health secretary. It is because our procurement and there are too many watchdogs and people watch. So there is no freedom at the uh, middle level bureaucracy to procure. Of course, we have to prevent uh, the possibility of corruption. But I think we have to give our decision makers, uh, makers a little bit free hand to procure things locally. So it's not the CG and the CBI are always lurking somewhere in the background. Yamini is I would just one more point because if anybody is disagreeing with Yamini, I would also disagree with Yamini that, uh, you know, center did open its first strings and I have never seen, I've done 31 years in the IAS. I have never seen such fine collaboration between center and state governments when it came to COVID. I mean, I would call up the health secretary government of India in midnight, 2 a.m. and they would respond with resources, advice. When I had issues with ventilators, they gave me 1,200 free ventilators. So the cooperation and collaboration between the federal and the state was phenomenal. And I have never seen it in my career. You know, that tempts me to talk a little bit about uh, the sharing of uh, revenue between the center and the state. And I know Yamini would love to have a full session on that. But there's a very interesting question, which relates to the point of what is it that the government should be doing and what should it not be doing? And there's a very provocative question from a lady called Akanksha, which says, what do you think about the Madhya Pradesh government trying to track working women in the name of enhancing women empowerment and safety? Sucheta, would you like to be tracked for your safety? I think a lot of things that various state governments are doing, including the love jihad, I don't know whether we want to go down that road, but there's a lot of things state governments are doing, which we uh, are completely and vehemently opposed to. And that, you know, it's part of some kind of mainstreaming of thought process. Uh, I don't want to discuss it. It doesn't make sense. There is a question that Aryan asked for Hindus and Gupta. When you state that there is a need for reform, does it not matter that the reforms themselves should be helpful, stroke inclusive, and the fact that reforms should be brought through discussion and not through stealth, bracket, ordinances? It depends on which reform. I mean, you know, I was recently on the BBC and, you know, somebody said, oh, you know, India hasn't discussed its farm laws enough. You know, I was in journalism 15, 20 years ago and literally, literally, I kid you not, one of the first stories I wrote was about how agricultural reforms was important in India. So, you know, I mean, I agree that more debate should happen, but you know, there also has to be a limit to how much debate. And uh, I think Hindu, all, far, yeah, I got that in yes. Point, because, you know, then again, somebody will say something else, but you know, this, I mean, in India, it's a difficult balance on how much, and as far as inclusive or non-inclusive is concerned, we'll have to zero down on which exact reform the questioner is talking about. Fine. So since we, since you mentioned uh, farm reform, Yamni, would you like to comment on the process by which the farm reforms were brought in? I think just uh, constitutionally, the process of bringing in changes to ordinances is problematic. I think the fact that there wasn't a long debate in Parliament on legis on the particular whether or not we should have we should reform agriculture markets in the different ways of doing it have very much, as Indol has pointed out, been part of the debate for a long time. The mechanism, the means, and the how uh, of these particular laws were not debated in Parliament, which is a site where these debates ought to take place. And uh, that's fact. That's that's all I want to say on that.
Yeah, Aryan persists and says, putting what you're saying in the context of the current farm laws, and this is to Sucheta, the Farms Produce Act, as it was passed, stated that a dispute cannot be taken to a civil court, which has caused concern. What is your view on this, Sucheta? Absolutely. That is my biggest concern with farm laws, because, you know, I look at a grievance redress very closely in what I do, both as my, in my writing as and in Money Life Foundation. And I find that India as a country is so poor in grievance redress for us who I think are uh, sort of more uh, urban with access, even people like us, once you have a problem. So you may have systems, you may have mechanisms when things work smoothly, it looks perfect. But the minute you have a problem, it could be, you know, a crore of rupees going out of your savings bank account. The kind of fight that you have or whether it is for insurance, we as a country are not focused at all. Now, the farm laws are 10 times worse than this. So when I'm talking about what issues people have and brokers defraud them or they have a problem with the market or money disappearing from your bank account, which is happening all the time to, uh, to lakhs of people, okay, in this whole modern digitized world that we are all so proud of because they say those percentages are small. But if you are that statistic, you are part of that 2%, your life is finished. In fact, some a big reform like Aadhaar, for instance, can lead to sort of just make you uh, financially dead because you don't exist because you can't ac access facilities. So if you have a set of farm laws, which ab initio say you can't even ac access the system, which is slow, which Supreme Court judges are now telling you, which is slow, which is not working as well, which is expensive, then, I mean, this itself is such a core problem with farm laws, isn't it? And you're expecting farmers with the least access to be able to resolve things. And I'm saying that grievance redress is an issue across the board. Look at GST. I mean, we talked about something that comes through an ordinance and not discussed appropriately in parliament. GST was a drama. It was midnight session in parliament. Four years later, every single chartered accountant who was gung-ho about GST is today groaning fed up because there have been some 900 changes and you can't fix it. Same thing with MCA 21. You ask us to, you know, uh, put things online. All our filings are online. You don't have a net that works. You have net that is shut down at the first sign of trouble. It doesn't work. The systems don't work. Nobody's accountable. They've set up some systems and that's the end of it. And look at farm laws. What are people supposed to do? I don't even want to discuss anything else on farm laws. I think this is the one which farmers have a right to protest about because there's no point talking about it four years later and then fighting it out for the next 30 years. I think people don't get that in 92, they set up a special court to try the security scam. That court is still functioning. <laughs> I mean, it's still the first level. It's a shame on this country. We are not embarrassed. So this brings me to our last question, which is that in all of this discussion, um, We've talked about health, we've talked about education as being core to welfare. Uh, what about justice? Yamni? Yeah, okay, Hindol has put his uh, finger up. No, sir, I want to, uh, you know, I, to Sucheta's point, I were points, I want to make a point which is connected to what Yamini was saying earlier. Look, we have to agree that the state has a capacity problem. This no one can deny that there is a genuine capacity problem. And it is true that, you know, my father, for instance, who's a retired government officer, is very happy he doesn't have to go to the bank to prove that he's alive from time to time to get his pension. He can do it on the phone. But there are instances, like he's old now, so sometimes on Aadhaar, his fingerprint doesn't register. And I was not able to get an Aadhaar because my fingerprints have uh, got erased. So uh, last... La, we just have one minute left. So I'm going to ask each of you to say in less than one sentence that if you had to talk, if you had to choose one area of Indian welfare where you would like to see greater focus, what would that be? Yamini. Health and education. But I also want to say... Too, we, Yamini, start, we started talking about growth and I want to say that we actually need to revisit that. And I think the farm laws and all the market change, dynamic shifts that we have seen through these new ordinances, legislation, etc. India needs to have a different conversation. How do you build a pathway of growth that creates free and fair markets for all Indians? We need to go back to that. 
you are penalized if you took more than one sentence rohit i think uh, employment and employability of our youth i meet 100 visitors every day and 80% of them talk about you know employment and poor employability sucheta your vote oh we lost you um just two words oh. accountability and grievance redressal across sectors i think that fixes a lot of issues hindol i want to go with sujeta and say what to do when things go wrong because all our policies are built assuming everything will go right but there is nowhere to go for the citizen where things go when things go wrong and i like is up thanks all of you for a most fascinating uh, discussion for making yourselves available and for helping us to uh, uh, spend this saturday afternoon in this virtual jlf have a wonderful weekend thank you thank you thank yeah. you Thank you Yamini Ayer, Rohit Kumar Singh, Hindol Sen Gupta, Suchita Dalal and Mohit Satyanand for such an enlightening conversation. And thank you so much for being part of Jaipur Nrita Festival 2021. We thank our celebration partner Diageo. And thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. as you are aware the cultural sector has been critically impacted by the pandemic and while we have braced ourselves to embrace the new normal we have struggled to ensure that we can continue to bring you a free flow of knowledge and ideas we'd love for you to support us at team bocards any contribution is welcome and would help spread knowledge and ideas seamlessly against all odds also please tweet using #jaipurlitfestival2021 @jaipurlitfest the festival is protected by jetall Hope to see you in the next session. Thank you.